Hello and welcome to another Mental Health for All webinar. This is a project run by United for Global Mental Health and as the Editor-in-Chief of the Lancet Psychiatry, my name is Niall Boyce. I'm very pleased to be a collaborator. Uh, over the past few months, we've had all sorts of interesting discussions on the subject of mental health worldwide, both with uh, relation to this current pandemic and, of course, mental health beyond that subject. And uh, today, we're going to hear about a groundbreaking new report, which for the first time maps funding for mental health research by geography and by subject area. So uh, what we're going to do is learn about how this report could help change the future of funding for mental health research. Now, the report has been published online by the uh, International Association of Mental Health Research Funders. You can also see a health policy paper which describes the method of the report and the findings, and that is uh, online on the Lancet Psychiatry website. You should be getting a link uh, in the chat box. And then also uh, there's a comment on that report uh, by one of our guests today, Vikram Patel, which I'd also have a read of. Uh, what we're going to do is have a chat with our panelists, and then we're going to take questions and um, really hopefully move this field forward, which so badly needs to be moved forward. So I'm just going to introduce our panelists. Luckily for me as chair, our panelists are all superstars in their field, so they need very little introduction from me. We're joined by Daniel Kemmer uh, of the International Association of Mental Health Research Funders behind this report. We're also hoping to be joined by Miranda Walpert uh, from Wellcome. Uh, we have Vikram Patel uh, from Harvard, the godfather of global mental health, we might say, and also uh, Kwame McKenzie of the Wellesley Institute. Uh, hello and welcome to the webinar. Good to see you all. Great to see you now. Thank you. I, I hope I don't turn out like the godfather, but anyway. I'm joining by phone. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. Oh, and I'm here. We have Miranda. Brilliant. So we have a full house. So without any further ado, what I'm going to do is get going. And uh, the first question is for Danielle. Now, Danielle, big study, big effort. What was your motivation as an organization to do this particular study, to look at these issues of mental health research funding? Thank you, Niall. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that we managed to do this in COVID times. It's certainly not easy to carve out space and attention for anything else that's not immediately COVID related. So I want to thank everyone who's paying attention today. Um, so working in the mental health se sector, mental health is an extremely poorly coordinated sector. And I think there are many voices in the sector that advocate for increased funding, for increased research funding. Um, but our question has been for, for years now, is like, how can you advocate or effectively advocate for increased investments, increased funding, if you don't even know what you currently spend on mental health research, let alone like what it's spent on and how the money is distributed. So this was really um, for our group of an international uh, network of mental health research funders, we thought we would be ideally positioned to create that baseline, a global baseline of, of investments for the sector as a whole, with the goal really of providing guidance to priority setting and decision making like worldwide. And uh, guidance to all, like not only to research funders, but also like to academics, to policymakers, and even other mental health professionals that up to now really uh, have based on assumptions, the way they, they, they conduct their research um, and where the big needs are. So we really wanted to contribute to the sector in a meaningful way. Okay, so what you were doing is putting together a map so we can see where we are and we can figure out where we go from here. So perhaps you could tell me what, what the, the headline findings were from your, your report. So, I mean, initially, uh, obviously, like everybody else in the sector, so we were also like uh, guided by those assumptions over the years. And we, we thought to find um, things that are not equal around the world. But when we then looked at the data and we really, uh, the data came in, we were stunned how, um, how stark those inequalities and inequities even were. And, in terms really, I think the starkest inequity that, that struck us was the, the unequal distribution of funds around the world. I mean, literally, almost exclusively all research funding 
is being raised and spent in high income countries. I mean, we've certainly thought that it was mainly spent in high income countries, but not to this extent. I mean, it is goes beyond the 1090 uh, divide. Uh, so this was very uh, surprising. There were other things that we were uh, we were surprised as well, like uh, the way the money was spent in terms of types of research and the different diseases, like what, what kind of investments were put into the different areas. So we basically discovered uh, stark inequities across the spectrum. These were, I think, the main findings, hence the title of our report, The Inequities of, of Mental Health Research Findings. Funding. And one of the one of the things which I keep coming across in mental health is um, the, the the concept which uh, actually a British GP called Julian Tudor Hart came up with many decades ago, which was the inverse care law, that essentially the people in the most need tend to receive the fewest resources, and this is a phenomenon in health, and I think from what you're saying, it's a phenomenon that's that's magnified in mental health and specifically in, in mental health research. Now, um, Danielle, who is putting up the money for mental health research? Yeah, that was another that was another finding. It is basically exclusively governments around the world. And um, I mean, myself, I work in the philanthropic sector, and um, we've certainly been advocating uh, for many years for increased investments in the mental health sector by philanthropists and, and donors. And uh, looking at this data, it is it is really it is not happening right now. And also what was surprising, I mean, I think we all working in the sector have experienced a great change over the last two years in terms of attention paid to the sector. And also, I mean, airtime we get working in the mental health sector is very different now than from a few years ago. And despite all this, if you look at the investments in mental health research, they have stayed flat and stable over the last few years, which almost no investments or very little contributions from the philanthropic and charity sector. Okay, so we've got a lot of talk. We don't have enough money, so people literally need to put their money where, where their mouth is, it sounds like. And I'd like to pick up on this issue of most of the money com coming from governments. And I'd like to turn now to Vikram and Miranda and say that, that in this report, it, it turns out almost all funding does seem to come from governments. Uh, the UK is, is, is maybe a bit of an exception here. Should other countries follow in the footsteps of uh, the UK with more funding from charity, more philanthropic funding? Um, Vikram, what do you think? Well, I think this is true of all health research funding now. I don't think mental health is an outlier. In fact, Danielle, you know, one of the things that struck me about your report is how if we remo remove the word mental, all of this would apply for any other area of health research. Uh, you know, there's not enough money being spent. It's mostly spent on very, very skewed populations that represent wealthy countries. And within wealthy countries, it's largely Caucasian populations that are well-educated. Um, and that is always on much more on basic science and implementation. So I think by and large, this is, this is the way uh, the, the structure of health research funding more generally is based. And I think we need to understand these findings within the context of these broader power structures. So I think governments play the key role also for health research funding. The US, the world's biggest health research fund is the NIH, which is entirely funded by the US taxpayer. So I do think there should be more in response to your question, Niall. Uh, I, I do think there should be a lot more health research funding more generally across the board uh, for, 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 uh, from countries, we shouldn't rely on, on foundations and philanthropists. Uh, God knows, I don't think foundations and philanthropists operate in transparent and accountable ways. They're not accountable to anyone actually. Um, and if anything, there's a danger that they skew the agenda in the direction of whatever their pet causes, uh, not reflecting actually what their country or their population and community needs, but what they personally are embracing, which is not a problem. But I don't believe for a moment that they should replace what the state actually has a mandate to do. Okay, well, Miranda, I'd like to, to put that, that point to you. You know, is there a, an issue perhaps with funders such as Welcome skewing uh, the research landscape or its converse? Is there maybe a role for funders such as Welcome in correcting some of these inequities which uh, the report details? I, I mean, I take uh, Bikram's points very seriously, and I think that Welcome, certainly as a funder, thinks a lot about its responsibility and who it's answerable to in terms of the wider public, trying to think about our systems. But uh, Bikram's right that philanthropies uh, and foundations such as Welcome have a lot more flexibility and freedom 
than do governments and others. And I think that comes with responsibilities and also risks, exactly as Vikram said. I think to go to your second part of your question, there is an opportunity where philanthropies and foundations can fund more cutting edge things, where they can make sure that they're not caught in groupthink, where they can prepare to take risks and prepare to fail. And we need that in research funding for mental health science if we're actually going to advance and move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think there's room for both. And absolutely, as, as Vikram and Danielle have said, we need uh, funding that comes from governments, come, come from philanthropists. But also, I think moving forward, we need to create a, a giving model for individuals so that uh, large numbers of small care scale giving from individuals can actually form a basis for philanthropic giving. And it's probably just worth mentioning in this context, there is a, an international coalition being led by Garen Staglin and Victor Zhao, which Welcome is supporting, I know others on this call are also involved in, called the Healthy Brains Global Initiative, which is trying to bring in a, a global fund for mental health research, which will have a, a, a more of an overview, more of a global view, um, and bring philanthropy in at a more in, in, at scale. I mean, I think, Miranda, that a lot of this, if you're talking about really opening up the landscape for mental health funding, part of this is about communication, because I mean, I, I, for instance, see that in terms of oncology, the communication there in terms of both philanthropic and individual giving is so much clearer than it is in mental health. The idea as to what's needed, what the benefits of the research are, maybe this is just the nature of the field, but do you think there's some more work to be done in terms of communicating the need for mental health research and the, 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 the benefits of you know, putting the pound in your pocket into uh, to funding it? Completely. And I think that we have a real um, hill to climb in terms of helping people see what mental health science and mental health research does and what it can contribute to the mental health agenda. And that that isn't really part of the dominant narrative in the way that cancer research, for example, is. So um, I think there are complexities in mental health that, that add added challenges, but I think the time is now to start to explain to the wider public and others exactly what the role of research and science can be and should be. Um, and we are really happy to be working with others on this agenda. And I think this is a fantastic report. I want to give credit to Danielle and the team for really having our first global baseline on these issues. Thanks. So Vikram, back to you. Now, as for what you, your views are on mental health research funding, I'm just going to read the headline of your comment, which is, mental health research funding too little, too inequitable, too skewed. So to my mind, there's not much of a mystery as to what your, your view on this is. Um, <laughs> but what, what I'd like to know is with the, the context of this report, what should change to increase the impact and to make mental health research funding more equitable? So I think we need to recognize uh, first and foremost, Niall, that researching populations that are diverse can actually not only help us address the grand challenges in global mental health, which, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for those who are not aware of this, was the largest and most systematic research priority setting exercise ever conducted in the field, which included very diverse practitioners and research disciplines uh, and, and found, not surprisingly, that implementation science was the single most important question. Uh, unfortunately, what Danielle's report has shown is that in spite of that, uh, that, that evidence, uh, in fact, most of the money is still going to basic science. Um, Nevertheless, it's important to certainly have more funding for implementation science, which, uh, which will help populations around the world. But beyond implementation science, I think the inequitable global distribution of mental health research funding is also greatly limiting the basic science agenda. And as I write in my commentary now, it's incredible that 99 cents of every dollar that has been spent on basic research has been spent entirely on researching a narrow homogenous population with a common ancestry, basically Caucasians in a few countries of the world who share not only very similar ancestries, but very similar social and cultural context. And as I say, that's akin to trying to map the Amazon uh, ecosystem by focusing your gaze on a tiny thicket of trees. There's no way in hell that we're ever going to actually understand mental health problems with our current model of funding. And it's in the interest actually of discovery science to actually begin to research outside the usual suspects. Kwame, is that something that you'd agree with, that up till now the, the scope has just been too narrow, too selective, too restrictive in mental health research? Yeah, I think I, think I would. I mean, I'd like to start off though by congratulating Danielle and the uh, IAMH RF just rolls off the tongue uh, in, 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 in the report. And I'd also like to 
thank United for Mental Health for the webinar series because we're able to have this conversation. And it's difficult coming third in the converse, fourth in the conversation because we've already talked about democracy in controlling funding. We've talked about fairness in funding. We've talked about systemic racism in research, which uh, the Grams just pulled up. Uh, and um, we have talked, but we haven't talked about the fact that even the whole conversation is skewed by our lack of great data on this. Um, I, uh, and Niall, of course, then, you know, we, we have the moderator who stole my thunder because I was going to talk about the inverse care law. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, and yeah, but I just wanted to make sure that we got it right. Some of the things in this report, there are a few more things. Yes, we've got the inverse care law saying that we've got funding going to high income countries, though we know there's a desperate need for better research in poorly served low income uh, countries. Uh, research is mainly in basic sciences, though, as Vikram said, uh, in, implementation of science is really important, service system research, cost effective interventions, and of course, we mustn't forget that social factors that make people ill and stop people getting better account for 85% of our risk, and so the social determinants of health is important. But the last thing in the report that I didn't want to lose was that most research is not on children's mental health, uh, though most of the mental health problems start in childhood. So I agree with everybody, the report makes us think we need to rebalance our research effort to make it more efficient and equitable. Uh, we need to think about low income settings, we need to think about more work on children's mental health, and we need to be thinking about clinical interventions, social policy, and social determinants of health, which are more likely to improve world mental health. Uh, fundamentally, though, we do come round to the question that it's not clear that we have agreement on uh, research priorities, grand challenges as nearest we've got to, um, what the research is actually for and what it's trying to do. And because of that, we end up with this scattergun approach. And in this scattergun approach, uh, the people with the most connections, the most powerful, uh, the, the people who are nearest to the money get the money. And so we really do need to rebalance if we actually want to use this research effort for good. Thanks. Um, I, I, I think this is, this is the thing about reports, that I think any report or any uh, scientific paper indeed is only as good as the effect which it has in the world to actually change practice and change practice for the better. So with that in mind, with, with Kwame's comments in mind, Danielle, I wonder what the next steps are for the IAMHRF. Uh, so all the of the time, you say IAMHRF. IAMHRF. Hi, is that? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Jim. <laughs> I've just done a webinar, I've come off. I'm just yeah. checking, I'm still muted. Hold on a second. Yes, hold on. And, Miranda, um, you're not muted, but we'll come back to you in a moment. <laughs> um, Danielle. So what's what's next? Following the publication of this report, how are you going to make sure this has an effect? What are you going to do? Well, from our funders forum, we feel a great responsibility to put this in front of the people that need to see this data. I mean, that's our first, that's really uh, where we feel very strongly that we can play a role. I mean, uh, this group of research funders, I think what's always important to understand is that we have a niche opportunity here for this, that what this group is particularly well positioned to do. And I think the study was one of those, uh, those roles we can play. Um, so disseminating this, this report widely is certainly something that we, we see as the next steps. Then within our group itself, I mean, part, members and partners of our forum, of our network, um, they spend a lot of money every year on, on mental health research. And I think within our forum, we really want to drive those conversations around uh, like priority setting and decision making, like how this information can inform um, how each of those organizations, including the, the largest funders that are part of our forum, will spend money going forward. If this, this information will have any influence on, on how they spend, how they set priorities within their context, but also how much money maybe they spend in other parts of the world. Um, so this is certainly something um, from a technical perspective, because maybe we mentioned that as well, we certainly want to advocate for more uh, data sharing of, of funders. I mean, 
we had access to a lot of data, but this picture is far from perfect. That's something that needs to be improved. Um, so that's a message that goes out to the to the co global community, the funding community, like make your data available. If we want to understand what the picture looks like, we have to have access to data. So that's certainly something. And then lastly, which is something that um, we as a group also feel very strongly about is um, actually revisit and refine the mental health classifications that we used in this report. I mean, don't forget that the way this data was queried and how uh, this information was pulled out was really based on classifications that were developed and designed in uh, high income country settings. We now broadly applied them to data from the whole world. Uh, doing that, I mean, it was the only tool we had at our hands, and these are great tools, but they need to be further refined now that we apply them globally. And that's something we want to look at, we want to work on, um, to really make sure that we capture going forward, we capture cultural nuances that are certainly happening uh, around the world when we look at, try to capture mental health related data. Um, so I think these are the the big things that we we want to address going forward immediately. Thanks. Now I'm just going to check. Miranda, are you on the line? Uh, I am. And apologies if I had to take an emergency call earlier. I'm back now. No, no, that's fine. Well, I was I was just going to follow up with with you on this question as to the what next because I think this this sort of follows on from two two of the points which um, Kwame made, which is that there is this age inequity as well as the other inequities in the report in terms of funding for youth mental health and also that lack of a common aim now i quite like the welcome um mental health priority areas common aim which is that no one should be held back by mental health problems um and so you know to to an extent you know your design of the mental health priority area has anticipated maybe some of the things which have arisen from this report how are you as a funder going to take the findings of this report and, and move forward to correct inequities and to fulfil the goals which you've set yourself? Well, this, this report couldn't have come at a better time. As you know, the Welcome has just announced that we are going to be taking mental health as one of our three key challenges going forward. And it's going to become an even bigger part of our portfolio going forward, along with discovery science, uh, climate change and infectious diseases. So this is the opportunity for us to really hold true to our promises to make sure that we are thinking broader than healthcare, that we're embedding lived experience in the heart of everything in terms of all research agendas and that we're looking at local innovation. And that means looking broader than the weird countries, the Western educated, industrialized, rich and developed areas and trying to think about how we uh, address the inequity of research where 80% of the population actually live and making sure that it's led by researchers who live in those populations and that we're encouraging early career researchers and those with new ideas and including drawing on those with, with older ideas who have so much still to offer and that that's across the full panoply of research science that ranges right through from sort of epidemiology, psychiatry, psychology, neuroscience, but encompasses economics and the social sciences and even the humanities and the arts, so that we, we get those perspectives in to address this, uh, this global challenge. And I think for the first time, we've got a sort of concept now of a mental health science research baseline that we can now hold ourselves to account for to see does this picture change and how can Welcome Help shift the needle on this. Thanks. Um, I'm interested now in just talking about any specific gaps in research. And uh, Kwame, I wonder if you could tell me what do you think the remaining um, evidence gaps are for well-informed priority setting and decision making in deciding mental health research funding? Yeah, I mean, I, lo I love the report, as you said, and the report uses the available data. But I think we always have to be careful when the available data is deficient and uh, the available data doesn't have good information on women's mental health research. It doesn't have good information on uh, mental health of racialized groups, uh, diverse groups within organizations, within um, uh, states, or poorer people or older people. We, we haven't got enough of a breakdown uh, to be able to know exactly what's going on. And that lack of visibility, specifically on gender issues on, on, and then ethnicity is worrying. Because if you build a house on uh, foundations that are not completely solid, uh, then over time, uh, things become much more shaky. Um, and so I think uh, we, we need to be careful about those gaps. 
and think about those gaps and see if there's any way of plugging those gaps, um, even if it's in sub-analyses of particular, of, uh, particular uh, funders, uh, to really make sure that we don't magnify that lack of visibility in uh, the structures that we then uh, create around the search forward. Yeah, and the other thing, um, the other gap perhaps, is really defining what mental health research actually is. And I know this is something which, you know, was a challenge for the authors of this report. So I wonder if I could follow up by asking what needs to happen to further refine this type of study to measure all of the research investments which are relevant to mental health. I mean, yeah, Miranda's just told us this whole sort of broad range. Do we need to, to broaden our minds a bit? Well, for me, yes, because um, I think we have to be very clear that this report is about mental illness research. And it's about a subset of mental illness research that the report specifically didn't talk about the things that I've been talking about, such as the social determinants of health, such as policy, such as positive mental health uh, and uh, mental health as a part of public health. This is really quite specific around mental illness research. Uh, and I think we do have to broaden and really be thinking much more along the lines of of welcome. It becomes a, a lot trickier with regards to the type of report that um, um, that uh, Danielle was trying to do, um, but I think that it is necessary, uh, especially when you're thinking in uh, some other jurisdictions where that wider type of research is may have much more of a bear bearing on the uh, mental health of people than the more limited uh, research. Thanks. I mean, I think that this is probably not the time to relitigate all of the issues around DSM or ICD-10 classification of, of mental illness, but clearly that framework can be quite restrictive if we're thinking about mental health research, because as, as you say, Kwame, it, it, it sort of tends to push us more into mental illness research and maybe a very restrictive uh, type of mental illness research. Okay. So, so, Sorry, I think yeah, so that's good. Go on. on top of it. Um, there was the joke that they were trying to uh, put a new diagnosis, which was called um, IDDD into DSM-5, which stands for Implementation Deficit Disorder. And I think if, if we, we, we look like we've got an implementation science deficit disorder that is missing out of research, so maybe it should be ICD-11. Um, because, uh, yeah, we, we, we miss, the, the, these are disorder the, the disorder-based analysis, um, I know that Danielle's thinking about this, doesn't capture most people's experience. It's, it's very narrow, it's got a specific uh, mode, and I think um, that um, building uh, your mental health research on disorders is, is problematic in the first case. D Danielle, how's that um, perspective going to inform your thinking moving forward with future work and reports in this area? So I have to admit, while, we, while doing this report, this was front and center, like uh, our thinking. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind that this is the first uh, baseline we created and just using the tools that were available. And we are painfully aware of the gaps and also things that we couldn't measure, we actually tried. Um, so if you think about uh, gender related issues, race, ethnicity, even the comorbidities, you know, you can only measure like what you can actually pull out of the data. And for everything related, like that, whether demographic uh, elements play a major role, like within the research, and you want to pull this out, you need a certain quality of description, grant description, research description that is not there. And we tried. And it, right now, the way grants are summarized, um, it's just not well enough. Uh, the description aren't good enough to, to conduct such an analysis. So it's a very tr tricky issue to address because it's not only about the funding; it is also about how the fund, or how the research is actually described. And so um, several things need to happen to make this this better, this kind of analysis, and fill those gaps that are still remaining. Um, but I definitely. Uh, 
think that going forward, really revisiting classifications and going beyond the diagnostic systems-based classifications and really thinking more broadly about mental health is something that we definitely want to address. I mean, we ideally, we want to redo this kind of analysis maybe in a couple of years or so to also see whether there's an evolution. I mean, we don't do this to keep the status quo uh, the way it is. I mean, we want to see an evolution. We want to see increased investments. We want to see things change. And we can only see if it changed when we revisit, when we remeasure. And um, we're really determined that the next round of, of looking at this data will be better. Um, we, will, we will have refined the tools we're using and hopefully we'll have uh, better, better data as well um, that are available to us. But that's like, this is a message we certainly need to get out as well. Like um, you need to describe whatever you look at. This research needs to be described very well. And it needs to be, even, even in these su summaries and abstracts, things need to be put out very clearly, that it becomes very clear what's been looked at, that it can be used by efforts like this. Thanks, Danielle. Now, if you are watching this and you have any questions for the panel, do pop them in the chat and um, I will put them to the panelists. So I just have one more question before we go to that part of the webinar. And this is uh, really to, to bring us from, we've been talking about the future, I'd like to bring us back to the, the here and now. And my question is uh, really for, for Miranda, first of all, which is what are the immediate opportunities to address these inequities in mental health research funding? So I think, uh, you know, welcome to doing what it can. And uh, it already has its strategy and that's for everyone to see and please have a look at that. We, and I guess this is really an, an, an open offer in the sense that if anyone's got suggestions of how we can make sure that our uh, funding reaches uh, more equitably uh, a wider variety of low resource settings, that we hear a greater diversity of voices. We're open to any ideas, any creative ideas about how we as funders can step up the place and work with other policymakers to do so, we're open to. All our calls um, uh, are global and we are putting them on our website. There will be calls coming up in the next uh, uh, year or so. And I guess it's also worth saying, and, and now you'll know this, that we're, we're, we've created uh, with the National Institute of Health a common measures board, which is as a group of funders coming together to agree core metrics that we want people to use. And it may be that alongside that, we need some, some further work on the common language, language we want to use in order to capture core information without tying ourselves in knots around uh, sort of fights over diagnostic categories. So I think the challenges are real, but the opportunities are real as well. And we're really open to any creative ideas you've got about how we can take that forward. Thanks. So Vikram. Do you have any? Because what we're trying to do here is sort of build the plane as we're flying it a bit. So what, what, what can we do immediately on the basis of this report, do you think? Well, I think certainly disseminating this very widely is extremely important. I think recognizing that we're spending 50 cents per capita of the world's population on mental health, mental illness research. And I want to actually completely second what Juan said. Um, in fact, it is very mental illness focused, for example. And this is where I think our sector is quite different from physical health. We, for example, let me give, let me illustrate what I mean. If you had research on tobacco, that would usually be counted within the realm of cardiovascular uh, disease research. But you do not count research on early child development, reducing adverse experiences in childhood, bullying, school health promotion as mental health research. Um, and I think that is because these are all the environmental and social determinants that Quam alluded to, which are profoundly important for prevention. In other words, actually the entire prevention world uh, which is, goes beyond indicated prevention, is actually not counted in, 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 in this bucket. Um, and I think, therefore, there, the, you know, so, so Daniel, that is a really important point. Anyway, you know, circling back to your question now, I mean, disseminating this uh, as mental illness, illness research, and I think that's important, Daniel, in the framing, uh, is that we're spending too little on people who are already sick. Uh, uh, and 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 that that needs to change urgently. And secondly, that there needs to be far more equity into representing implementation science and diverse populations in that funding. That's what I think is the major priority. And to do that, to get people with a lived experience involved, is going to be very very important. People from diverse backgrounds with the lived experience of mental health problems speaking about what the lack of research funding has meant to the care that they have received. 
Thanks. Now we're going to go to questions from you, the audience. The first question is, is a very straightforward one, so we'll start off with that. And this is really for Danielle. Has the report and recommendations been shared with the NIHR already? What, so, sorry, uh, can you repeat? Yeah. I didn't... This per person asks if the report and the recommendations have been shared with NIHR. Oh, NIHR, they are part of our group, so they should. Yeah, so they know. Yes. So that was an easy one. <laughs> that was an easy one. Okay, that's good. Um, yes. So we'll move on to the next question, which is not an easy one. And um, this interestingly relates to what uh, you were just saying, Vikram, which is, is there a risk that increasing focus on public mental health funding happens at the expense of mental illness funding? Do we have to make a choice? Is this either or? Uh, well, I think it's important to remember that public mental health funding is probably already happening, but under different labels. Um, so, for example, if domestic violence interventions are public mental health, which to me they are, uh, they are fundamental for the prevention of depression and suicide in women, well, then I think it's there's a lot of resources going that way. The thing is that uh, what we need to be doing is building bridges with researchers in those other sectors. So, for example, they are paying attention to mental health outcomes so that we can build an evidence base around prevention that currently is lacking because all we really have is an observational evidence base that shows that there's an association between things like domestic violence and mental health, but really very little to go for uh, the, to support interventions for prevention. So I think adding those, collaborating with that, those groups is, is extremely important. I don't think there should ever be a competition Competition between the two. There's a lot already happening, but they're happening in very different silos. And that is, of course, the biggest problem in the mental health field is how fragmented it is. And I'll end by just saying, consider children's mental health. There are at least six different disciplines with totally different journals, different, you know, child development, child neurology, child psychiatry, child psychology, you know, and it's incredible how little they actually know of what the other disciplines are doing. And so the, in, in, in some, if you put all that together, there's a heck of a lot going on, but a lot of it is duplicative and there's very little communication between these different groups. All right, Kwame, what are your thoughts on that? How do we bring together this fragmentation and can we have public mental health and the more clinical side mental illness? Can those two actually work together or will they always be in, in tension and in competition for money? Well, I think that um, when, there, when there's not enough money, people are always in competition. <laughs> That's what happens. And uh, actually the focus and part of the focus of the work should be to increase the pool. And I think if you increase the pool uh, and you can still increase the mental illness research, but you give a greater proportion uh, to uh, the non-illness focus pieces of research. So, there's, so you, you don't want an either or, you want a both and, and you want a, a, a forward looking strategy which understands that the simplest way to stop progress is to get people fighting with each other uh, and so i think that's that's the way of thinking about it going forward of course they can live together they do in every other branch of medicine uh, not equally um, but if we can move to more equity we will get better outcomes and i think if we can make sure that we're all clear what we're trying to do uh, then it becomes easier to negotiate a balance. Thanks. So, sorry, Miranda. Yeah, I just want to come in partly to sort of vigorously agree with my learning colleagues, but but also just to say that I think sometimes, um, obviously there are difficult decisions to be made, but sometimes there's a false dichotomy between a focus on illness and a focus on prevention or on wellness. You know, and I'm thinking about that that illness doesn't mean healthcare necessarily, and uh, nor does prevention necessarily mean people that don't have any problems. And I'm thinking some of the mental health problems we have currently may actually be acute problems that are made chronic by our lack of ability to prevent them happening again. So you know, if you just take something like a first instance psychosis, if one of the areas of research is to try and prevent that turning into a chronic problem, that is a form of future prevention that in a way is also part of the illness agenda. So I, I think as others have said, it is a balance of, of getting both aspects in. Thanks. And Miranda, I'd just like to keep you uh, on for a moment because one of sure. the, the next questions I think is a good one for you, which is uh, this person says this report is so important as a first step in understanding the impact of mental health research efforts. But as Danielle has so eloquently said, we need help in encouraging funders to share data. Any ideas as to how this can be achieved? 
Yes, I, I think this is a big issue and thinking about how we share data and share knowledge about impact is really crucial. We are delighted to be working with um, uh, open science initiatives, publishers and others on trying to make sure that all research that's funded um, balances privacy concerns, uh, the needs of the researchers who are collecting the data and the wider wishes of the wider research community to have access to those data in using the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and I can never remember, reproducible. Um, and again, we're open to any ideas about how best to do it. We recognise these are not simple things, but if we're all committed to that, and I think part of that is, a, is giving more status to individual researchers for sharing their data than is currently in the system. So currently in the system, researchers get rewarded for publications and for grants, but they don't get rewarded for making their data accessible to other researchers. We need to change that lever and introduce some way of rewarding researchers so there is an incentive to share uh, very early on. Thanks. Now this is this next question is, is an interesting one. It's, it says, what about creating a specific community of health researchers to bring into the fold of global mental health who are not currently in it? folks from the African Academy of Sciences, for example, and other trusted and legitimized groups that already exist. How do we bring people into the fold? Um, Kwame, do you have any ideas about that? Well, I was, I was really glad then uh, to hear that um, uh, said because um, one of the things that sometimes happens, and this has happened, say, recently during the COVID research, just in Canada, where um, we put into our COVID call that we wanted more research for on indigenous populations and for racialized populations, and you don't get very much coming through because of course you have to build capacity to make sure those things will come through. And it's not that the, the ideas aren't there, it's not that, the, that, the, um, that there, there aren't people there who can do the research, it's that there's a whole apparatus that there needs to be for people to see and the research calls to answer the research calls and then the capacity and research capacity around building the scaffolding around researchers so they can actually do the work right and i think if we're serious about rebalancing um, the mental health research that means we have to be serious about how we build capacity um, and it doesn't have to be capacity that mimics all of the problems that we have um, in uh, high-income countries, but it does have to be capacity to do uh, real and relevant research in low-income settings. Uh, and it's hard to do that uh, unless um, there is uh, clear backing and long-term backing for people uh, to build uh, research. And, and I think there's much more that we can do uh, in, in, in that realm. Thanks. Um, now we have one more of the panel of the audience questions left for the panel, and then we'll just go to our roundup question. Uh, and this last question says, this is a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. You've argued for equity in terms of data curation, e.g. better descriptions. Great point. But what are the common standards for inclusion of information, etc.? Danielle, would you like to address that? Well, I don't know if they... <laughs> There is right now, I don't think there is any, there are any guidelines that everyone ad adheres to. And um, I want to stress also, come back to what Miranda said before, I mean, uh, through our group, one of the things we're driving as well are harmonization efforts and, and developing standards for various areas. So be it like stand standards for tools that are developed or um, how to involve people with lived experience. And I think this is something that we should address as well. And it might be an opportunity for our group as well. I mean, the good thing is when you work with many funders, research funders from many places, that if you come up with something together, your reach is very big. And so there might be an opportunity to do that. But to my knowledge right now, there is there are no such standards. Um, or guidelines or rules that everyone adheres to, which is part of our problem, which is part of the fragmentation. And there is also, there are no quality standards really that everyone um, adheres to. And th that is true certainly um, for many areas that we, we struggle with. And that's an area where we feel there's something that we can, we can move the needle possibly as well. Thanks. Now it's elevator pitch time and for this, you'll have to imagine this is not an elevator in a very high rise building. So if you could keep the answers brief, that would be great. What I'd like to know from each member of the panel 
is what your top priority action is on the basis of this report. And I'd like to start with Miranda. I was afraid of that. Top priority <laughs> is to, to make sure that we do this report again within two years so that we actually hold ourselves to account to see if anything's changed and how we've changed it. And, and my second that supports that is to make sure that fantastic organisations like the International Alliance of Mental Health Research Funders, United for Global Mental Health, who are bringing together the field, who are trying to develop a common language, are appropriately supported and enhanced to make, make sure that that, uh, that, that that capacity continues. Thanks. Can no I have a, if I can have a third? Oh, sorry. If I can have a third one, you can, you can, uh, would you, you just one more, quickly, yes. which, was, which was just to rise to Kwame's point that I think also to learn to put in the hard work and the foundations that allow us to develop relationships with those communities we are not linked with currently, both in low and middle income countries, but also across different disciplines and to know that's going to take time. That's it. Thank you. Kwame. Um, most research wants to do good and we all want to do good, um, but it looks like we're actually increasing disparities with the research we're doing. We need more research in low-income settings, more research on children's mental health, and more research on clinical interventions, social policy, and the social determinants of health. Um, we've got an inverse research, uh, research law, and we need to uh, break or change that curve. Thank you. Vikram, top priority. Well, yeah, just, just to build on what Kwam's just said, I, I think we need indicators that will actually align with the findings of this paper and the discussions we've had today. For example, an indicator that doesn't only look at the amount of mental health research funding, but how it is being spent so that it corrects the inequities and disparities that have just been referred to, but also, I believe, that also reflect the impact of these research investments. Because let's be absolutely blunt, if there is more money going into cardiovascular research and cancer research today, it's because people can claim that that research has had an impact on population health. Uh, and, you know, I don't think we can claim anything near that unless we are more clever about how we make links between our research investments and what happens on the, at the population health level. Thank you. And finally, Danielle. So, uh, so our priority is certainly uh, something I said already to bring this this report in front of as many people as possible. And then secondly, and I think that speaks more to the broader role of our group is that to really make those connections that need to happen to broaden like these type of, of studies. I mean, to be more inclusive, to be more globally relevant as well. And I think for that, we just need to increase uh, our connections to organizations that are based in other parts of the world and that need to be at the table. I mean, they need to be part of those conversations. And I think it's our role to bring those, those organizations to the table. And the AAS was, was mentioned before in Africa and organizations like that, we need to, to bring them here and make them part of the effort. And I think like this, some of the things that were discussed today certainly will be much easier to do. So. Thank you, Danielle, and congratulations again on the report. I think what this discussion has shown is another illustration of, of, of the principle uh, common to psychiatry, common maybe to, to medicine in general, which is that good intentions and ideas about what intuitively should work are not enough. We need evidence. And now we have this evidence, we need to act on it. So I'd like to thank uh, United for Global Mental Health again for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for attending. And of course, thank all of our panelists for a great discussion. If you've enjoyed this webinar, the recording and notes will be on the United website uh, quite shortly. You can join us again next week on the 10th of December at 2 p.m. when there will be the launch of a new report on universal men mental health on universal health coverage and mental health. Uh, and I hope to see many of you there. But for now, thank you again for joining us and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye.